Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Our topic here is going to be on HELP syndrome. Now, is that a typo? Why is HELP all in uppercase? And the answer is it's an acronym. HELP is an acronym. And if you remember what HELP stands for, you will probably get any question right on the USMLE on HELP syndrome. HELP stands for hemolysis, H for hemolysis, EL for elevated liver enzymes, and LP for low platelets. In other words, this is a patient with hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, and elevated liver enzymes. Here's how the USMLE is going to ask you a question on HELP syndrome. They're going to tell you a woman is here, she's 34 weeks along, 36 weeks along, she's got a history of preeclampsia, but they're probably not going to tell you that. They're probably going to tell you that she has a 1 plus dipstick proteinuria and she's her blood pressure is 145 over 95. And now you get a CBC and liver function test as you should and your CBC shows a platelet count of 90 and a normocytic hemolytic anemia with schistocytes. That would be a classic way for them to give you HELP syndrome. And oh, by the way, their, her liver function tests show an elevated AST, ALT, LDH, etc. Okay, they're going to give you a laboratory profile, history and a laboratory profile, and all you're going to be responsible for is knowing that this is a particular kind of preeclampsia known as HELP syndrome. Now, whether or not HELP syndrome is a particular type of preeclampsia, or if it's its own entity and has features of preeclampsia is really a controversy. So you won't be asked anything too detailed about that. Uh, so uh, we'll go on and talk about this in a little bit greater detail, but just a little commercial here. Please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can click the link below uh, on the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner of your screen and that will link you to my page. Just consider chipping in a dollar a month. A little bit goes a long ways and helps keep these videos free. If you subscribe you'll have access to some of my premium videos that I put up which are uh, case studies and we go into sort of how you look at the case, how you make a differential diagnosis, what labs to order, and then I go in a little bit and talk about uh, what was wrong with the patient. And that's very useful, not only for step two, but particularly for step three with those clinical case scenarios where you're gonna be expected to do that. So thank you very much in advance for your consideration. So this is another of the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, but it is a little bit of a black sheep. Why is it a black sheep? Well, because not all women with HELP syndrome have overt signs of preeclampsia. And so it's kind of its own thing. However, most women with HELP syndrome do have preeclampsia. Now, as we already mentioned, HELP stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Okay, so just by knowing the name of the syndrome, you know exactly what's going on. Wouldn't it be nice if all diseases were like that? just acronyms and then you know what's going on if only but this is what help stands for and it is a complication of preeclampsia although some think it's a variant of preeclampsia that it's its own syndrome and it shares some similarities to preeclampsia but it's not preeclampsia that's a controversy you don't need to really think too much about that but the prevailing wisdom over the last several decades since we identified HELP syndrome is that it is a complication of preeclampsia, that this is a severe preeclampsia uh, with a very unique uh, laboratory presentation. If you look at the criteria for what makes preeclampsia severe preeclampsia, not just mild preeclampsia, you will see some of these Help features on that list. So uh, like a hemolytic anemia is one of the possible distinguishing features of severe preeclampsia from mild preeclampsia. Also elevated liver enzymes and thrombocytopenia. So if you just have one of these, it's still going to be severe preeclampsia. But this constellation of hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets, this is what makes HELP syndrome. And like I said, there are some people who think that this is a different disorder 
uh, alongside preeclampsia, related but very distinct. Okay. So what the hell? 15 to 20 percent of women with HELP syndrome do not have preeclampsia. That's a substantial number. So if you take five women with HELP syndrome, one of them doesn't have preeclampsia. She doesn't have protein in the urine. She may not have hypertension. However, 10 to 20 percent of women with severe preeclampsia will develop HELP syndrome. So there's some kind of relationship between preeclampsia and HELP syndrome. The question is how tight is that relationship? Obviously, if 10 to 20 percent of women with severe preeclampsia are developing HELP syndrome, but only 0.1 to 0.8 percent of the general population develops HELP syndrome, there's some relationship between preeclampsia and HELP syndrome. So some of the risk factors for HELP syndrome compared to preeclampsia. First off, it's an older maternal age. Whereas we saw with preeclampsia, it's kind of the extremes of maternal age, so teenagers and over 35, which we consider advanced, advanced maternal age, AMA, over 35. That would be for preeclampsia, but for HELP syndrome, it tends to just be older maternal age. So with HELP syndrome, the mean age is 25 years. So that doesn't mean 25 years is old. It just reflects, compared to preeclampsia, which has an average age of 19 years, that it's a slightly older age uh, with HELP syndrome. White race and European descent. How does that compare to preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is overrepresented in the black population. But out of all of those black women that get preeclampsia, they are much less likely to develop HELP syndrome than their white counterparts. And then a previous pregnancy with HELP. So 2 to 27% chance that a subsequent pregnancy is going to have help. What's the presentation? This is where the difficulty is. So you'll see a lot of similar features to preeclampsia because these coincide so often, but you can't totally rely on it because one in five women with HELP syndrome don't have preeclampsia. So what are some of the things you look for? Nausea and vomiting. Well, don't all pregnant women get nausea and vomiting? A lot of them do, but it's in the first trimester when that beta HCG is so high. Third trimester, shouldn't be having nausea and vomiting. Might get a little bit of epigastric discomfort as the fetus starts pressing uh, on the stomach and on the bowels and everything. But this is severe, nausea and vomiting. Epigastric pain, yeah, you might get a little bit of that normally. Again, very nonspecific, but this is the big one. Right upper quadrant pain. Pain that is almost like a gallbladder attack. Very severe right upper quadrant pain. About 30 to 90 percent of patients with HELP syndrome will have these things. Headache, 33 to 68 percent chance. Why? Well, HELP syndrome tends to coincide with severe preeclampsia. One of the big symptoms of severe preeclampsia, not present in all of them, but in a lot of them, is headache. Headache and visual changes. So this is just a reflection that HELP syndrome is kind of a variant of severe preeclampsia. And then jaundice. Why would they get jaundiced? Well, because there's some kind of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia going on here with the platelets sticking together, and then the red blood cells go by them, and it takes off a chunk of red blood cell, spills out hemoglobin, uh, which then goes on to become uh, bilirubin. And so they may have an elevated bilirubin. Uh, that indirect bilirubin can then get into their skin, cause jaundice. Only about 5%, though. And then they may have other features consistent with severe preeclampsia. So they may have acute renal failure. They may have pulmonary edema and so forth. What do we do for workup? Well, pretty much the same thing you get with anybody with preeclampsia is you want to work them up. You want to get a CBC with smear, you want to get a BMP, and you want to get liver function tests. There's one more thing that you want to do if you suspect HELP syndrome. If you see this right upper quadrant pain, or let's say you do these labs and it looks like HELP syndrome, then you want to get a serum amylase and lipase. Okay, so let's say you get your labs. CBC with smear. In, in the presence of HELP syndrome should show some level of low platelets, of thrombocytopenia. Now, what would be a low platelet count? 
Well, probably anything below 150. All right, but it, platelets have a wide range. It can be very severe. It might just be mild. But thrombocytopenia, okay, you've got to have that, low platelets. Anemia, there may be anemia, but remember that women with preeclampsia are going to have some level of hemoconcentration because a lot of that fluid is going out, causing some of the edema. So that may falsely elevate uh, any anemia that's present. So you may need to uh, take that into consideration. Another good way that you can look for this, though, is with the bilirubin count, uh, which you get here with your liver function tests. When you look on smear, you may see schistocytes. Schistocytes, schistocytes, potato, potato. Why do you get schistocytes? Well, because of that microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. You get those platelet sort of, uh, you think of it like these, uh, these sort of barriers in the capillaries, and when the red blood cells go by at such a high speed, it cleaves off part of the red blood cell, causes the schistocyte to form. BMP, elevated BUN creatinine. Why is that? Because a lot of these patients intravascularly are dehydrated. And so that's going to cause that sort of acute renal failure, pre-renal uh, issue. Liver function tests. Elevated AST, ALT, LDH. That's the elevated liver enzymes, the EL part. Increased bilirubin because of the hemolytic anemia. Normal PT, variable PTT because this is a platelet issue. You're going to have consumption of factor. Uh, and so you will have a variable PTT. It may be high, it may be normal. Serum amylase and lipase. Now, why do we get that? What's going to tip you off to get a, a serum amylase and lipase? One of two things. If the patient comes in, has right upper quadrant pain, you're getting the serum amylase and lipase just, just for that alone. However, if she comes back with a picture of help, and we'll know she has a laboratory picture of help just based on these three tests. So she's got thrombocytopenia, she's got elevated liver enzymes, and she's got a, uh, a hemolytic picture of anemia. Then just from that, then you're going to get an amylase and lipase. And there's a good reason why we do this. Because one of the major differential diagnoses of HELP syndrome is acute fatty liver of pregnancy. And in this case, it's a little bit different has a different prognosis, different management. We're not going to talk about it, but it's a different disease process. This is much more severe, much more problematic. Uh, in both cases, the definitive treatment is delivery, uh, but acute fatty liver of pregnancy is a differential of HELP syndrome. You're going to get a very similar laboratory profile, very similar presentation. Uh, it often does coincide with preeclampsia. But another hint that you may get is if you get this bilirubin, well, if you just have a hemolytic anemia, you're going to have an increased indirect bilirubin. But if you have acute fatty liver of pregnancy, where not only do you have issues with your liver, but you have it of your gallbladder and your pancreas, that whole sort of tract, then you're going to have elevated amylase and lipase as well. So in HELP syndrome, the amylase and lipase will be normal. But if it's elevated, then you have a diagnosis of acute fatty liver of pregnancy. This, I highly doubt, will be tested on the USMLE. HELP syndrome will, AFLP no. But I just thought I'd include that just for completion's sake. Other things that you may find, a low haptoglobin, a low fibrinogen, a high D-dimer, uh, just demonstrating the mechanism of this disorder that you have a hemolytic anemia secondary to a microangiopathic process. So the lab picture is a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with liver dysfunction. Objectively, that's all you've got. But we know that this occurring in the context of a pregnancy, typically with preeclamptic sy symptoms, we know that this is HELP syndrome. So what do we do to manage HELP syndrome? Once you confirm it with labs, you want to stabilize the patient's condition, really get a good assessment. So you want to uh, do a fetal assessment, look with ultrasound, uh, do cardiotochometry, and really just listening to the fetal heart tones is the most important thing, though. You want to commence IV access, and then you also want to get a Foley to monitor eyes and O's. Medications. Well, if she's hypertensive, in many cases she will be, 
you want to give hydralazine or labetalol. You don't want to drop it too low, though, because you can cause utero, utero placental insufficiency. So you kind of want to stick around 130 to 140 over 90 to 100. Uh, that's typically the range you want to hover around. You don't want to go below 120 over 80 by any means. Seizure prophylaxis. All patients with HELP syndrome are getting magnesium sulfate because we consider, controversy aside, we consider HELP syndrome to be a severe preeclampsia. So they're going to be getting magnesium sulfate. And then as far as their liver and platelet goes, this is unique to HELP syndrome. We will give them dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is protective of the liver, and it also can help those platelet counts go up a little bit. Okay, so dexamethasone is given uh, for liver enzymes and for platelet count. And then you can recheck periodically to see if that's improved. Dexamethasone also matures the fetal lungs, so there's that uh, additionally that is useful to us in certain circumstances. You want to periodically recheck the CBC looking at the platelets and the LFTs looking at those liver enzymes. If there's a worsening of the liver enzymes, so if the AST and ALT are continue to go up, in that case you want to get an abdominal CT because one of the complications of HELP syndrome is a subcapsular hematoma. And if left to its own devices, that can rupture. And that would be a very, very, very bad thing. So if you give dexamethasone and the liver function, or the liver enzymes continue to worsen, you want to get an abdominal CT. You can also do sonography or MRI, but CT is usually what's done. Uh, and you'll look for a, uh, a subcapsular hematoma. Eh, some might prefer a sonography too. Eh, it doesn't really matter. You'll, you won't be asked to choose between them on the test. If, if you, this would be 99th percentile sort of stuff. Uh, but do remember that one of the complications of HELP syndrome is a subcapsular hematoma in the liver. You want to notify anesthesia because this woman's going to be delivering pretty soon in most cases. And anesthesia will want to know if there's HELP syndrome because they need to know about the low platelets. Because when they go in to do a spinal or an epidural, if there's low platelets, they need to be aware of that. And then as far as delivery, if she's unstable or you're unable to stabilize her, you want to deliver immediately. Because delivery is the only cure for HELP syndrome. If she's beyond 34 weeks and stable, you'll give her dexamethasone. And then you'll deliver after 24 to 48 hours. If she's below 34 weeks and she's stable, you'll give dexamethasone, and then you'll evaluate for delivery after 24 to 48 hours. You want to prolong this as long as you can to allow those fetal lungs to develop. Uh, postpartum, you want to get consults, so hematology, nephrology, and general surgery. Hematology, looking at her low platelet counts. Nephrology, looking at any degree of, of renal issues that she's got, and general surgery, especially if she's got the development of a subcapsular hematoma. So this is from a hematologist, how he approaches uh, HELP syndrome, and he likes to use the gestational age and the platelet count. Now, if the gestational age is beyond 34 weeks, then he bases it on the platelet count. So if the platelet count is low, he gives dexamethasone. If the platelet count is normal, he just does delivery. I guess he's not really concerned so much about the liver enzymes, uh, but this is how this hematologist ap approaches it. So gives the dexamethasone for low platelets and then presumably rechecks it. But this is important. Give the dexamethasone again after delivery. And that goes for a lot of these sort of preeclampsia things. You're not out of the woods after delivery. Okay, that fourth stage of labor uh, is after the after the placenta delivers and then after a couple weeks from there so you can develop eclampsia and preeclampsia and you can have continuation of help syndrome beyond the delivery uh, so he prefers to give dexamethasone uh, again after delivery if it's before 34 weeks he does the dexamethasone and then uh, determines whether there's stability or not. If there's no stability, if they're deteriorating, he does delivery. If they're stable, he likes to continue keeping them pregnant for a couple more weeks to allow for fetal lung maturity. Uh, but the dexamethasone will do that. Okay, so you, as far as I know, you don't need to give betamethasone 
Uh, in addition to this, the dexamethasone, and this is relatively high dose, the dexamethasone will mature the fetal lungs. All right, and then this is important too. All of these patients ideally should be monitored in a tertiary care facility where there's going to be access to a perinatologist, especially where there's access to maternal fetal medicine, uh, ICU, etc. So the complications of HELP syndrome. Abrupt shield placenta. Out of all of the preeclampsia and eclampsia syndromes uh, that we've talked about, uh, uh, gestational hypertension, all of this, all of these hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. HELP syndrome has the highest correlation to abruptio placenta. So these patients are at very high risk of abruptio placenta. Why is that? I'm not sure. Maybe it has something to do with uh, with that uh, uh, with those platelets and uh, the uh, consuming those platelets. It may cause infarcts. I'm not exactly sure, uh, to be honest. Uh, subcapsular hematoma of the liver, that's unique to HELP syndrome. Hepatic rupture, DIC, pulmonary edema, and adult respiratory distress syndrome, and acute renal failure. So all of these things you see in, in preeclampsia, they're all complications of preeclampsia, with the exception of the subcapsular hematoma and hepatic rupture. Okay, and I imagine this is where that right upper quadrant pain is coming from, if it's severe enough. The maternal mortality for HELP syndrome is significant. It's 1.1%. Doesn't sound like a lot, but I mean, if I told you, <laughs> if, if I gave you a bag of M&Ms and I told you one of them will kill you and there's 100 of them, are you going to take your chance? Mm, probably not. So 1.1% is low, but it's, it's substantial. The infant morbidity and mortality is 10 to 60%, and a lot of that just depends on how many interventions you take how close you are to a perinatologist, uh, to a neonatologist, to a NICU, to where any complication of the infant can be managed appropriately. Okay, and that's all I've got for you for HELP syndrome. If you have any questions, write me a note below. Otherwise, I will see you on the other side.